In my previous talk about the South China Sea, how to steal a ship, I mentioned that one third of the world's maritime trade passes through here. That's $5.3 trillion worth. Within that total trade figure lies the fact that one third of the world's oil and half the world's liquefied natural gas passes through here each year. And to give an indication of the effects of anything impeding ship movements through this sea, let me just point out that two super tankers carrying 2 million barrels of oil, plus two carrying 200,000 cubic meters of LPG, must arrive in Japan each day just to keep the lights on. Now the South China Sea is an area of conflict outside of what you might call ordinary piracy. What is actually happening amounts to piracy by a state. Here, for instance, is the area claimed by China within what it calls its Nine Dash Line. Almost all of the sea and seemingly far from its shores. And here are the claims by other nations surrounding the sea, Vietnam, Malaysia and the Philippines. Within that Nine Dash Line, China has been arbitrarily annexing islands and reefs and ignoring all claims by the other nations that surround the sea. Particular hotspots are around the Paracel and the Spratly Islands, where China has been creating new islands. Here is one example of China's island building program, in this case a mischief reef in the disputed Spratly Islands. From a natural reef system, fully submerged at high water in 2013, by 2015 the coral had been destroyed and dredged up, and then by 2016 we could see a fully militarised base with runway, missiles and support facilities. Now such annexations by China have been going on for 50 years or more. But the process of China taking control of the sea has accelerated in the last 5 to 10 years. And this gives China the potential, within the next 10 years or so, to stop free access to shipping. I'm not claiming it will do so, but it is a scenario that's giving major concern throughout the area and beyond. It's not helped by the Chinese government's obfuscation, its fake news and its faulty claims. The other coastal states say that China is using a big belly policy, simply pushing against the rest with its greater weight. If a Vietnamese security vessel were to chase a suspect vessel into waters claimed by the Chinese, that could generate a military confrontation. And military conflicts of this nature have been happening. On the 3rd of April 2020, a Chinese Coast Guard vessel sank a Vietnamese fishing boat, the second time this has happened in the last six months. The Vietnamese boat was within the Vietnamese Exclusive Economic Zone, which I'll explain in a moment. But these are waters that China now claims. China has already criticised other nations for sending warships through what had been, until now, accepted by the world as international waters. The two aircraft carriers that China possesses have been sent on patrol, effectively as a warning that free passage is at its say-so. So let's look at how international law affects this situation. Every nation state with a coastline has a 12 mile territorial limit to its national waters. But beyond that, also set by international law, each country is allowed an exclusive economic zone of 200 nautical miles from the nearest habitable land. Well, China stakes its furthest claims on the James Shoal. The problem is that the James Shoal is 22 meters below sea level. It therefore obviously isn't habitable under any stretch of the imagination, so their claim shouldn't stand. Well, China just ignores that fact, all part of the big belly policy. In fact, China uses those same international laws to claim it is in the right, claims that are completely spurious to anybody of any sense. It's a classic example of might is right. Nobody is big enough to challenge China. But China is also justifying its claims to this huge area in two other ways. Firstly, by falsely claiming historical precedence. China's state administration of cultural heritage operates an underwater archaeological heritage centre, the UAHC. The centre's first expedition was to Chinese occupied but Vietnamese claimed Paracel Islands. In March 1999, 
it was announced that divers had recovered 1,500 pieces of Chinese porcelain from a wreck dated back to the year 907, and thus proving that China were the earliest inhabitants of the island. Well, the jaws of archaeologists elsewhere in the world collectively dropped. It was well known and recorded that almost all exports of Chinese porcelain at that time were carried on Malay or Arab ships, and that due to the collapse of the Tang dynasty, there was virtually no Chinese seaborne trade. The presence of pottery on any show is no proof whatsoever of Chinese historical possession. Now, the UAHC has a definite relationship to Chinese foreign policy, seeking to control the narrative in underwater archaeology. In 2012, when an international team were investigating a wreck on the Scarborough Shoal, 220 kilometers west of Luzon in the Philippines, a Chinese maritime surveillance ship arrived and ordered them to leave. Only Chinese archaeologists would be allowed to investigate the site. The international team were convinced this was so the Chinese could again find evidence of their country's sovereignty to the area. Then we come to false claims made to deflect any negative thoughts over what China is doing on a world stage, to deflect any criticism of their actions, to show how China is actually benevolent and working for the world as a whole. Its actions in the South China Seas are to ensure any and all resources of and under that body of water are controlled by China. So now we're going to look beyond the South China Sea to look at what's happening elsewhere in the world. So take that hero of Chinese maritime history, Cheng He, who sailed for the Ming Dynasty in the early 15th century. He didn't just cover the South China Sea, he also covered the whole of the Indian Ocean. He was adopted by the past Premier of China, Deng Xiaoping, as the poster boy for Chinese expansion into the cornering of world resources. Now here are quotes from Deng. Cheng He's voyages were friendly diplomatic missions. During the overall course of several voyages to the Western Ocean, Cheng did not occupy a single piece of land, establish fortresses, or seize any wealth from other countries. In the commercial and trade activities, he adopted the practice of giving more than he received, and was thus welcomed and lauded by the peoples of the various countries along his routes. And this same interpretation of history is at the heart of Xi Jinping's Belt and Road policy. The reality was rather different according to other non-Chinese records. Each expedition of between 50 and 250 ships carried over 20,000 troops armed with the most advanced weapons of their time, the purpose clearly being, I believe, for shock and awe. On Cheng's first voyage in 1405, he stopped in Palembang, Sumatra, to chase down a fugitive from the Ming court. 5,000 people were reportedly killed in the fighting. On the same voyage, his armada fought in Java against China's rival for supremacy in the South China Sea. He later established a garrison in Malacca to control the strait. In 1411, he invaded a Sri Lankan city, destroyed its military, appointed a puppet ruler, and took its king back to China as a hostage. There are suggestions that his forces committed atrocities in the Arabian Peninsula on a later voyage. The overall purpose of the voyages appears to have been twofold to control trade routes and to enforce the paying of homage to the Ming court by foreign rulers. This is a long way from the official picture of an outstanding envoy of peace and friendship promoted by Beijing. One recent writer wrote, The Chinese Communist Party knows that myth is stronger than history, and Cheng the kind of diplomat still sets sail whenever maritime cooperation needs to be discussed in Southeast Asia. So history is being pirated to prove China's claims over a vast area of sea and to give it a benignity to its trade practices across the world. As I'm sure you know, it's been loaning monies to developing countries for infrastructure and vanity projects. Those countries are unable to repay, and the major worry of many other countries is that this is to gain control of natural resources, to take over major industries, and to control the trade routes both on land and sea. Perhaps the so-called Big Belly policy will not be as successful worldwide, but it has and is working in the South China Sea. So from Cheng He of the 15th century, to pirate Queen Ching Shi of the 18th century to today, piracy in the South China Sea takes many forms. <laughs> <laughs>